A warm welcome to our reading from the book Community of the Unchosen Outlines of a Political Ethos of Cohabitation by Sabine Haag. Here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, a live event that's also online. So a warm welcome to all of you who found their way here to Schumannstraße, Sabine Haag and I and Sascha Salzmann. I will be introducing all of our speakers shortly. We thought a long time about whether we were going to have a live event, an analog event, so to speak. And we decided it, we do want to discuss this book with you live in person to the extent that that's possible. So a warm welcome to all of you here in Schumannstraße and also to all of those of you who are following us online. This reading will be in English and in German. A warm welcome to our interpreters, Zara and Max. I hope you've all found the right button on your uh, Zoom consult or that you're hearing the right language. I'm the director of the Gunnar Werner Institute, and together with Julia Hartlip, who is uh, sitting here in front of me, and Martin Sommer, we've organized tonight's event. My name is Ines. Kappert. And now I'd like to introduce our guests. First of all, of course, I will introduce the author, Sabine Haag. Many of you know Sabine Haag, but perhaps you did not know that Sabine Haag was born in Otzendorf in 1962. This was a new piece of information for me. Sabine Haag is a sociologist and a professor of gender studies at the Technical University of Berlin and also the director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Women's and Gender Studies at the Technical University. Sabine is the co-editor of the journal Feministische Studien or Feminist Studies. I and many others know that Sabine Ahag is passionate about teaching in higher education although she is also critical of the entrepreneurial university and is always at pains to combine academic action with activist knowledge and action. Her list of publications is very long, so I'd like to draw your attention to just a selection of her works. I believe um, one can't remind people of the book Dissident Participation, a Discourse History of Feminism from 2005 enough, which is a book that traces the course that a feminism turned academic has taken since the early 70s. So here we have the theme of the institutions and of movements and of the relationship between the two already. And then if we jump forward in time to the year 2017, Sabine Haag, together with Paula Irene Villa, wrote and published the essay a distinguish and rule, which part, um, takes as its point of departure the events in Cologne and the intersections of racism, sexism, and feminism in the present. Only one year later, in 2018, Sabina Haag published Surveyed Spaces, Tense Relationships, a book about the entrepreneurial university. I already mentioned that Sabine is a critic of the entrepreneurial university. And in this book, Sabine looks at what it means um, for gender relations when the university becomes a uni uh, an entrepreneurial university. And Sabine also looks at what implications this has for the career trajectories of female scholars. So this leads us to the book that we are presenting tonight, The Unchosen, which was published in September, and we're very happy to be able to host this reading in November, in spite of everything that has happened. I'd also like to welcome Sascha Marianne Salzmann, 
Theaterautorin, Essayistin, a Dramaturgin. Sie verwendet beide Pronomen, er who, und sie alterniert. Um, uses both pronouns, he und and she. Sie, wir machen das heute jeweils mit den Geburtsorten. Also Sascha was born in 1985 in Wolgograd and lived in Moscow dann until 1995. And then, as she writes on her website, he lived occasionally in the Federal Republic, then in Istanbul. Currently, she lives in Berlin. His novel Außer sich received numerous literary prizes and has been translated into 16 languages. And Sasha has just published a novel, In Man, Everything Must Be Glorious. Thank you, Sasha, for interrupting your reading tour in order to be here with us tonight and join us in reflecting upon the community of the unchosen. This takes us to Peggy Pische, who unfortunately is only with us off, uh, online. Uh, Peggy unfortunately can't be with us live because she is in quarantine. So we're very happy that, Peggy, you have nevertheless found a way to be with us here today. Peggy Pische is a cultural scientist and a scholar of literature who grew up in the German Democratic Republic, was born in Anstatt. Um, and for the past year, she's been leading and developing or building up the Department Political Education and Plural Democracy at the Federal Agency for Civic Education, focusing on issues such as diversity, intersectionality, and decoloniality. This is part of a newly emerging third location of the Federal Agency for Civic Education in the city of Gera. And prior to that, Peggy worked at um, the Gunnar Werner Institute, and Peggy also combines scholarly, academic work, educational work with activism, and she's considered one of the best-known voices of black women in Germany. She is a co-founder of ADEFRA, um, an associate, cultural political association for black women in Germany. Just a very brief um, list of her public in 2012, she published the volume Your Silence Will Not Protect You, Audre Lorde and the Black Women's Movement in Germany. In 2018, she published, together with Susan Arndt and Maisha Uma and Maisha Eggers, the volume Mist Masks and Subjects on Critical Whiteness Studies in Germany. And last year, in 2020, she published um, a volume edited by her called Labor 89 or Laboratory 1989. So, Peggy, a warm welcome to you. Community of the Unchosen, the title already raises questions. Who is this community of the unchosen? Who are the unchosen? And what is the community that they are supposed to form or that perhaps they already form? The key question, Sabina Haag writes on the first pages, the question that is negotiated throughout society is that of difference and belonging. To whom, I'm quoting, to whom is it given to come in order to stay and live in community with others, that is, to be able to see oneself as part of a we? And we might add, to whom is this not given? This topic of difference and belonging is one that has occupied Sabine Haag for a long time. In 2018, it became so pressing that the decision was made to write this book. What was pushing Sabine Haag to do this? What was it that was forcing itself into her consciousness? Sabina recalls various events at the beginning of the essay, and I'm only going to list a few of these because it's important to understand the context in which this thinking, this reflection about a different kind of community took place. In 2018, the climate catastrophe became palpable, more palpable than ever before, including in the wealthy North. 
it could no longer be easily ignored that the planet was struggling to breathe, as it were. And at the same time, there was a policy that was implemented from high on up, which lets many thousands of people die on the Mediterranean up until today, and it forbids people who would want to rescue or shelter these people from doing so. The ban on saving, rescuing human lives was crudely enforced by Horst Seehofer and a sustained mass protest against it has failed to materialize until this day. Nevertheless, and Sabine points this out too, there has been the emergence of a kind of activism that is opposed to brute citizenship. The collective Seebrücke or Sea Bridge, Maritime Bridge was founded and is still operating today in spite of the massive criminalization of the activists associated with it. 2018 was was also the year in which the Untalba movement uh, was formed and many thousands of people took to the streets in Berlin in order to resist the logic of divide and conquer and to develop a critique of racism and, and a notion of we that is oriented towards sharing, that is democratic. 2018 was also the year in which right-wing extremists in Chemnitz threatened refugees. I'm sure you can still remember the horrible images of people in a bus being threatened by a mob. And this mob or these ordinary citizens did not have to face any legal consequences for their actions. This is a situation that is that extends beyond Chemnitz. The situation at Germany's borders and Europe's borders was a terrible one in 2018, has perhaps become even worse, has certainly not become better in the meantime. And this form of barbarism is also something that is desired or at least tolerated by those in power and by those who vote for them. So this logic of deadly deterrence that um, that we've been seeing in this field is something that Sabine Haag also engages with. We're de dealing here with a continuity within policy that where humans are divided into two groups, the privileged, those who are privileged and let others die, and those who are considered superfluous. The assassinations of, in 2020 or the murders in Hanau um, are also an event that is part of this context. We have their names here uh, on the stage behind us. So this is the starting point for Sabina Haag's reflection on what she calls an entirely practical democratic way of life. The sociologist um, works according to the principle of polyphony and engages with other thinkers on the level of writing and of text. Sabine Haag wishes to um, create a community in order to instigate a learning process that, as Audre Lorde said in a conversation with Adrian Rich, a learning process that is a riot or an insurrection. And if you've taken a look at the book, you will already have noticed, or if you've looked at other books by Sabine Haag, that Sabine Haag is really serious about quoting, citing other thinkers. Her writing is characterized by a radical pro propensity towards citation. So those are my words of introduction. Um, we have envisioned the following course of events for tonight's event. Sabine will read from the book, and then we will have a conversation here on stage, and we will be happy to take questions from you, the audience, um, both um, those of you who are here with us physically and those of you who are online. So we will have, we will be collecting questions that are 
formulated online by those of you who are following us online, and they will be addressed here as well. So now I'm happy to hear Sabine Haag. Thank you very much, Ines, for this wonderful introduction and for having made this event possible. I'm glad that many have had the courage to be here physically. Up until this morning, we were still discussing whether it would be sensible to meet here in person. We um, went back and forth in our assessment of the situation, but we decided that this is going to be a safe event. And so I'm very glad to see you all here. Thank you also to Sasha Seitzman and Peggy Pische, two people that I absolutely wanted to have here with me during tonight's event. So I'm very glad that the two of you are here with us because I believe that with the two of you, I will be especially able to go into greater detail regarding a few of the issues that have just uh, been spoken to by Ines. So questions concerning literature, what literature can do, what literature perhaps can not do, questions concerning testimony, uh, testimony of violence. These are some themes that we will be discussing tonight. So thank you very much for um, giving me this um, possibility to be here. I'd also like to thank Johanna schuster Greg, who I believe is following us online and who has uh, translated my um, book into English. And this is the English translation that the interpreters will be reading from so that those of you who don't speak German will also have the opportunity to hear um, the text that I will be reading in German as I wrote it. I've selected a few passages from these for this uh, roughly 20 minute reading. I'm not sure I'll be able to read all of the passages I selected. I will make an effort to touch um, as many different themes that are addressed in the book as possible. And by way of introduction, I also want to give you an impression of the questions that moved me to write this book that I was thinking about when I was writing this book. Ines has already mentioned the question of difference, the question of belonging, the question who can belong to whom, who is granted the right to live in a community. Then, of course, there is the question, who are these unchosen people? And we will be addressing all of these questions in the course of tonight's event, although I'm sure we won't be able to discuss them in full detail. So the first passage I will be reading is from the introduction. Community of the Unchosen is dedicated that, namely the question of difference and belonging. Who is it given to, to come and to stay, to be able to think of themselves as part of a we? This is not the first book on this topic, and it will surely not be the last. The question of who belongs to a we is one um, that concerns all of us how we go about uh, our economic activities, where we live and work, who can live where, who can settle where, who has access to infrastructure, from access to clean water and fuel, up to access to digital infrastructure and trash removal, and including care in times of sickness and dependency. 
how we place ourselves in relationship to each other and for one another, how we care and watch out for one another, for the planet with whom we live and other species with whom we share it, what we believe in, what we fight for politically and who we treasure how and what we want to know and which knowledge we share, who and what we consider normal and worthy of protection, how we live, how we are in the world and how we shape our coexistence. I call this an ethos of cohabitation, i.e. a way of living together. To sketch a broad outline of this ethos is the task I've undertaken with this book. What is not on offer is a fully ripened theory that has the answer to all these questions about how societies are best constructed. Instead, what's on the table is a sketch for a thoroughly practical, democratic way of living that is sensitive to power, a way of living that is founded upon care for the self, for others, and for the world, and that has found its guiding principle in the simple fact that people populate the earth in the plural, which is why everyone is entitled to the same right to thrive in the world without exception. The more we ravage this planet, the more inhospitably we structure the societies in which we live, the less frequently we offer shelter that permits people to thrive, and the tighter we draw the boundaries around the space of what is human and what is livable, all the more of us, whether voluntarily or out of necessity, will take steps to alleviate our need and to seek our fortunes somewhere else. And the more an authoritarian politics of discrimination and separation, contempt and disdain, the division into those who are useful and those who are superfluous, those who can be trusted and those who are strange into normals and deviants, chosen and unchosen, claims space, the more of us will stand up and leave and put all of our energies into reimagining this we as something else. And this won't happen somewhere else, but rather amongst us. And who could possibly deny us? So what is an offer are exercises in political thought, roaming reflections to all those urgent questions of the present as to how we want to live globally, exercises with companions in thought collected with the intention to think and write with them in democratic constellations, not in order to prove that there are gaps in their thought, but rather to create connections in community with them. And that means creating possibility, including that of dissent and controversy. Some of them I had explicitly chosen a long time ago as intellectual companions. Other fell into my lap while I was working on this book. They crossed my way. Some of them unasked, also imparting something to me. An assembly in which nevertheless every voice counts and should be heard. A polyphonic choir of the many in a litany of rebellion that has long been underway on the public squares and streets of this world, just as in virtual spaces and in the myriad habitats in which people have crafted a home and shelter for themselves, even if it still is provisional. In collective housing, in Leipzig and Konstanz, in shopping and cooking, collectives in Accra and Lagos, and in the kitchen of feminist activists in Buenos Aires, Mexico City, Barcelona and Warsaw in classrooms, at workbenches, and on basketball courts, in community gardens, in queer networks of care, in migrant self-organizations, on rescue ships at sea, and in camps for refugees, and safe houses for those who have escaped domestic violence and sexual assault. Everywhere, where people insist that their lives also count, that they want to be called by their own names. Wherever they insist, no, not that way, not to be ruled, 
in so much as they can rule themselves. Wherever people stand up and leave relations and conditions that exhaust them, deplete their power and etiolate their imagination, we can find something better than death anywhere, said the donkey to the rooster to the cat to the dog. So much, perhaps, uh, from my introduction, which I think sets the framework of the book uh, quite well. The next uh, paragraph I'm going to read is from a chapter with the title The Tasks of Critique. And in this chapter, on the one hand, I looked at the meaning of epistemic violence, of violence that is uh, manifesting itself in the form of knowledge. And I asked myself, what would be the tasks of uh, critical thinking, uh, critical theory, and the academy to, to deal uh, not only with this matter, but also to contribute to its reduction? Now, there is one figure that's very important to me in that chapter, and that's the figure of ghosts, following the ghosts. That's what this abstract is called. A suggestion made by the sociologist Avery Gordon can serve here as a compass for us uh, to also um, recognize epistemic violence. In Ghostly Matters, Haunting and the Sociological Imagination, Gordon writes that we have to be ready to follow the ghosts where they lead us. And in doing so, we are neither allowed to deny their origins and their belonging, nor can we think of them as exhaustive, nor should we try to divest ourselves of them. This would be a useless enterprise anyway, Gordon insists, because ghosts represent an enduring presence who would know how to demand the attention owed to them and who'd always appear if the problem that they embody or the symptom that they represent was no longer able to be checked and repressed, no longer able to remain, to remain unseen. Yes, I'd like to say to Gordon, the ghosts are among us. They push to the surface. They wrestle to be heard. The more we declare them to be outlawed, to seek to hold them at a distance, the more they seek to haunt the social imaginary. Ceux qui sont morts ne sont jamais partis. The dead have never left us. We only have to learn to listen to them. It says in Le Souvle, Breath, a poem by the Senegalese poet Birago Diop from 1943. We can hear their breath if we want to, the breath of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Kyla Moore, the breath of Mercedes Kirpach, Göchan Götechen, Sedat Gürbüz, Hamza Kurtovic, Said Nizar Hashemi, Vili Viorel Paun, Fatih Sarachoklu, Ferhat Unvar, and Kalyan Velkov. We can hear them, those other voices, the stories never heard that people have told and continue to tell about themselves, their origins and their future. The histories and stories of the other outlines of their selves, their abilities, their knowledge and their experiences that their stolen, stolen belongings announce, but that are objectified into museum artifacts that serves the aesthetic edification of white Europeans. We can hear them, those lives in the trenches of binary gender and heterocentric norms, on the trash heaps of our portly notions of respectability and the global matrix of coloniality. They are all collected in the both empty and populated space of all those speechless words that to the one who lends them an ear, make a muffled sound audible from beneath history, to borrow Michel Foucault's inimitable words. Just like the trauma passed on from generation to generation, which equally clips our ability to imagine the future as it prunes back our answers to the challenges of the present and clouds our view of history. 
They will not give us peace, not leave us alone. In any case, not as long as we haven't taken up the task that they have left behind for us. And for precisely this reason, we're not allowed to flee from the ghosts, nor are we allowed to turn them into a museum. Instead, we have to learn to understand what they have to contribute to the self-clarification of the struggles and wishes of the age. They can help us to make the losses present and understand how we are implicated in the social relations of supra and subordination and also find ways to grieve these losses and find out which forms of reckoning, repair and restitution would be appropriate. And to do this, admittedly, for the sake of the possibility that it could have been different and still can be different, that a different we is possible. To listen to the ghosts, and to translate using every method available to us what they have to tell us. This is how James Baldwin describes the tasks of the author, to be a witness, to tell the story by any means necessary, to look and report. Something that has happened, that's what the author and Nobel Prize winner Olga Tokarczuk exceeds. But that was not narrated, stops existing and disappears. Thus, we need a tender narrator who incurs the risk of seeing everything and who turns their gaze thoroughly and scrupulously to another being, to something that is not I. Hannah Arendt would have spoken here of an enlarged mentality, of the fact that we have to try to see the world from something other than our own perspective. So much perhaps on what I consider the task of critical uh, theorists to follow the ghosts and to bear also witness. Then there is another figure that is important in my book. I've already mentioned it, namely the tender citizenship. This is a figure that I gained, amongst others, from Olga Tukarczuk's um, thinkings about uh, tender um, narrative, which she presented a few weeks before this pandemic broke out. And I'll talk a bit more about this later on. This figure of the tender citizenship is juxtaposed to a different figure, namely that of brute citizenship, uh, being coined by Wilhelm Heidmeier, a sociologist, more than 10 years ago, in order to describe how the society is getting more and more violent, hoarse, and, and brute. Perhaps uh, the opposition to what we understand as solidarity, brute citizenship, the opposite of democratic empathy, devoid of any insight into the necessity of socially sanctioned solidarity, because society doesn't exist, just individuals and families do, as the former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher explained. Brute citizenship launched by and founded on neoliberalism and lined today in authoritarian, authoritarian, nationalistic and racist cloth. The so-called corona deniers come to mind, up to 10,000 of them side by side with neo-Nazis, fascists and right-wing extremists ready to engage in violence. They're moving through Berlin Mitte, as I write this in August 2020. They're talking about love and the necessity and inviolability of their freedom, that they don't want to be treated like children, that the state should keep itself out of how they're living their lives. For this, they eagerly risk the lives of others. They take the human immune system as a judge, na naturally given an inevitable. Deaths happen. You have to break eggs to make omelets. This is also a moral economy of life. 
brute citizenship, the manifest expression of brutish social relations, a severe grammar that simultaneously destabilizes the public good and the opportunities of individuals to build and maintain stable public and private bonds. A grammar played on the keyboard of accusation and suspicion that does not shy away from viral spread that set contempt and hate in motion and that know how to handle alienation, defamation, exactly like they know how to virtuosically deploy lies and betrayal. It's a generative social grammar that governs the framing of recognition i.e. whose and which lives count, in which they simultaneously accentuate this framing and consistently limit it. You, yes. You, no. A grammar that has to do with the ordering of allegedly excessive differences, with taming ambiguity and supposed confusion, the anxiety, uh, about precision and understanding is neither concerned with critically taking up the parochial partiality of one's own perspective nor with addressing the shadows of vision that accompany it. An expression of a way of being in the world that understands itself as the embodiment of the universal and only wants to recognize particularly amongst the others. Additionally, a way of seeing the world that looks away from the individual person and the conditions in which she is positioned. So that was brute citizenship. And before we move on to the tender citizenship, I'd like to present a short abstract where I'll be talking more about the unchosen. Who are they? What kind of figure are they? What role do they play in my book? because uh, it's certainly not the case that I'm intending to identify a specific community. It's first and foremost a theoretical figure that helps me to look at the historical constellations of privileges and religion, privileges and marginalization, but that also gave me the possibility to consciously dream of a different form of community which is democratic, but it's not based on origin of identity, uh, on shared uh, identity, on homogeneity, but on the joint responsibility of all of us, for all of us, for our planet and other species uh, that live on this planet, other creatures. The figure of the unchosen one tells us the story of the partition of the world, her division into thriving and prosper prosperous zones and those of drought and lack. She tells us the story of the division of humanity into those who are entitled to the sidewalk, to the pursuit of happiness for which the US American Declaration of Independence provides, and those who are summoned to wither and disappear. And the unchosen does this in three ways. First, as a liminal figure on the precipice between past and future, the unchosen keep the memory alive of the never silenced desire for freedom, equality, and solidarity of those who brought the Enlightenment into space of modernity and on whom they imposed the face of the unchosen. Second, a politically transversal figure, the unchosen, rattle every contingent border of the human, in that they again and again come up against this border that creates a division between people like us and people not like us, in the way that they thirst to overcome this border, expanding the sense of us, defining it anew, and thereby bringing humanity one step forward. They dare to riot, a riot that does not understand justice as the acceptance of those previously excluded or marginalized into precisely that order that had relegated them to the margins as unequal, a riot whose aim is to create a new order. Alongside Judith Butler, we can speak of a riot at the level of ontology, a riot at the level of the order of being, 
i.e. one that aims to leave the old order behind and to install a new one. When they repeat, this order must be destroyed, they say they don't know which order they're talking about. It says in Le Guerriere, a novel by Monique Wittig from 1969, nothing less than the ascension of everyone to being human, Fanon's dream, and the gift of the unchosen to the world the chance to learn how to grieve what is lost because we have never experienced it, in the same breath to move beyond grief and for us to learn how to imagine anew, making progress day and night in the company of all people. Franz Fanon was uh, finishing his novel The Wretched of the Earth with that sentence. And I think I'm almost coming to an end here. Just a few more excerpts from the chapter on tender citizenship. I've already said I developed the idea when listening to the Nobel Prize speech of Olga Tokarczuk. Tokarczuk and her reflections on the fragility of life and about what tenderness can do has given us a kind of compendium to have at hand for precisely this task of mending the world. She reminds us of something that is, of course, common to all of us, but something that we possibly have to salvage first, that we are all fragile, unique, unprotected and finite beings who require care that we are always already in the hands of others, delivered to them. We are the dispossessed, the unchosen, that we must be spoken to, thought of, missed by, grieved by, and remembered. We require touch, relationships, and help, networks and infrastructure in order to become an I that can survive. We, as Judith Butler says, are delivered from the very beginning to a fleeting field of touch and precisely thereby become a being capable of feeling, yes, even thinking and acting. Because we are acted upon, we are not left alone. Empowerment and subjection, exploitation and care thus often lie near each other, and precisely for this reason we must attend to the difference more carefully. Tenderness is the power to perceive and take care of the bonds between us, commonalities and consensuses, but also of what differentiates and divides us, of how we engage with one another and the planet, how we care for those narrative gaps that make it possible for us to become real, to become an I that does not contest space for the others. Tenderness, Tokachuk adds, shows us the world as alive and living, as bound in one another, dependent on one another, cooperative. She insists that tenderness remains modest, spontaneous and selfless in all of this and is not absolute possessive passion. To the contrary, tenderness abstains from emblems and symbols. It doesn't push into the foreground, knows how to hold back, pops up occasionally, and does this everywhere where we thoroughly and gently turn our gaze to a different being, to something that is not I. In the Stockholm speech held on the eve of the pandemic, nothing less than the vision of a new citizenship appears in that standard of world imagined by Aimé Césaire. I'm calling this a tender citizenship in order to set it in diametrical opposition to the brute citizenship that divides the world in two. A citizenship that has turned its back on the seduction of individualism and the fiction of a foreign subject that exists only for itself and cares only for itself. A citizenship that can rescind itself and address others respectfully, 
without once again re-centering itself as the standard in the response. That avoids generalizations wherever possible and knows how to put its own position into critical perspective that shares the sidewalk with everyone and has learned to look precisely and carefully and thus sees the radiance in all things as the Italian poet Mariangela Gualtieri says, that turns an ear to the others and lets them know that they mean something to me, that I am dependent on them, that I want something from them and they can want something from me, even if listening is not a postulate, as Christina Thurmarois says, it can't be demanded and certainly doesn't exclude dissent and conflict. This is the vision of a citizenship that is tender to the world, but not a citizenship that mistakenly turns toward romanticization, one that conceives of the world in all of her imponderability, contingency and unpredictability, and that cares for it. An expression of a social grammar of connectedness and polyphonic connection, knowledgeable of the divisions and separations in the world and ready to bear witness to them. A grammar of being relevant to one another, of political sensitivity and gentleness, oriented to the unconditional moral equality of all and focused on their well-being. Schooled in the art of counterpoint, this citizenship leads various voices equally alongside one another, permits them to coexist, lets one sometimes take the lead and sometimes the other, in that the voices relevant to one another contrapuntally bring each other into movement. It generally orchestrates the constant shifts between them, equalizing the difference between primary and secondary voices without making them indistinguishable and also without sweeping over their positionalities which are steeped in power. In this way, tender citizenship makes it possible that neither one nor the other voice can position itself in the right and the other in the wrong, as Adorno demands. Finally, it is precisely this not positioning oneself that today is the central thing to demand of individual people. A polyphonous choir of the many instead of a crescendo of one. Thank you very much. Dear Sabine, thank you very much for this journey from violence via the dream of a different society to tenderness. The first question I would uh, want to ask before I would invite Peggy and Sasha to join our conversation, the first question I would ask is the following. It's surely no coincidence that you use a terminology that one could say comes from um, the theory of democracy. So your title, which is translated as the unchosen, could also be translated as the unelected, so alludes perhaps to the theme of elections, you talk about citizenship and citizens. What role does this grammar of democracy play for your thinking, your dreaming, your uh, reflections on a truly democratic we? Well, it plays a major role. You said so in the introduction. There are several passages in the book in which I talk about a democratic way of living or about inventing a democratic way of living. The notion of equality plays an important role in my book. At the beginning, when I began thinking about these questions in writing about this book, I wasn't so aware of the fact that equality would turn out to be such an important value and would play such a central role. But I quickly realized that if I was to speak to this question of the right to community, or if I was to find an answer to this question, then I would n not be able to avoid the concept of equality. And 
the question of what it means when equality is not given because the history of modernity can be seen as a history of um, equality being, as it were, neutralized or, or, ta or, or taken out of operation. So we have the French Revolution, a revolution about that was all about liberty, equality, and fraternity, as was said at the time. It was, of course, not the, the democracy of the many, the democracy of everyone. It's the democracy of brothers, as the term fraternity shows. So this was, as it were, the um, the origin of modern democracy. And there we already see exclusion, the denial of equality. In um, the our earlier book, um, Paula Villa and I dealt with, engaged with this grammar of not just uh, divide and conquer, because when people are divided, one can still assume that they are equal. What is really happening is that there is a distinction that is made between those who can be humans and who can have rights, enjoy rights, such as equality and freedom or liberty. A distinction is made between those and others who do not have those rights. In the first resolution, first declaration of human rights, women are explicitly excluded, as are enslaved people, so-called savages, madmen, and children. They are excluded. They are explicitly denied rights, the rights of citizens. In democratic theory or the theory of democracy, there is a great deal of talk about the fact that these were democratic revolutions. I would say they were bourgeois revolutions that confirmed male white uh, cis male um, privileges and turned those people into citizens, but not the others. And so I engaged deliberately uh, or I made a deliberate decision to talk about citizenship and citizens because I believe it's important to reclaim these terms, not in the sense of a um, sort of uh, recuperation, but in, in a sense of a reformulation of what it means to be to be free and equal. You mentioned my other book, Dissident Participation. I believe that this is a characteristic movement of thought for me, perhaps, to always believe that we mustn't or cannot do something that is completely different, far beyond the world we live in today. We need to work through what already exists. The new, Judith Butler says in a passage that is very important to me, is always already there. It's always already been invented. Someone has always already worked on it. We need to create the conditions to make it visible. And she says in a passage that the new is what happens when we wake up from the dream about ourselves. And this is the dream that we in the West in bourgeois democracies are dreaming for two, have been dreaming for 250 years now, namely the dream that we are a society of equals, which is not the case. So that is something I wanted to uh, speak to in this book. I wanted to make a contribution to our awakening from this dream, and I wanted to make a contribution to our finally taking seriously democracy. Thank you very much. Sasha, when we spoke before tonight's event, um, we asked both you and Peggy, what is most fascinating to you about this book? What do you think about when you read this book? What is it that continues to, um, to, to um, engage you as an, as an issue? And you said epistemic violence. So it's been said that we need to develop a new dream, we need to work through what exists to arrive at a new dream. What is it that fascinated you so much with regard to this concept of systemic epistemic violence? What is it that will inspire you in your um, future writing? Well, I'm going to actually read um, that passage. 
But first of all, I want to say it's a great honor to sit here and um, be able to talk about this book with all of you. So this is not the only passage that I want to uh, talk about tonight. We only have about two hours, but also I should say that I am speaking as an author. I cannot um, speak as a sociologist, as an academic. I speak as a writer. Now, you've already um, mentioned uh, or implicitly mentioned epistemic violence. And you mentioned James Baldwin, who is one of the most important writers to me as a writer. And Sabine quotes uh, Baldwin in this book. And I'd like to quote that passage from Baldwin. This is from the chapter that comes before the chapter on ghosts. And I'd like to read a passage from shortly before that, which is about epistemic violence. Sabina says it's also a form of the politics of truth. And she says this epistemic injustice, this privilege of not knowing, has recently been pointed out by other scholars. It's a privilege that creates the time for the rulers to sp time that the rulers can spend with themselves. It's an expression of an asymmetrical moral economy that allows allows people who are far up in the social hierarchy to listen to themselves, to cultivate themselves. So this is a form of the culture of dominance and it's rendered possible by an epistemology of ignorance. So because we are able to ignore the role of others and because we're able to ignore race and gender, it's, as James Baldwin says, the crime lies in innocence. And that's something that I wanted to talk to you about. Because innocence, white innocence, is a term that James Baldwin coined uh, in his essays and also in his perhaps most best-known novel, Giovanni's Room. And so I'm very interested in, 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 in the, the a definition of white innocence that is applicable to what we are experiencing today or living today. I'd be happy to hear from you um, what kind of definition you think that should be. Thank you, Sasha, for this question. Peggy, you've been waiting for so long. I would like to give you an opportunity to uh, respond to this question raised by Sasha. Of course, you are not an example of white innocence, but you do work a great deal on the subject of black people, black women in Germany and elsewhere. You are working to render this topic visible. You are writing against ignorance, white innocence. You, what role does white innocence play for your thinking and your working? And what has Zabina's work contributed to your thinking about this? So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm glad to be able to be here. I'm glad that I have the technical possibility to join you. And Sabina, I'd like to congratulate you on your volume of essays, on your work, and on this um, global um, spectrum that you address um, in your work. Dieses, uh, Buch als ein I have understood this book as an das invitation to engage in solidarity, and that's something that is very interesting to me, that, in, that has a great deal of uh, potential to me and involves a great many arguments. I believe that the key message, at least as I understood it, of this book Ein anderes, uh, wir ist, is that a different we is wir, possible. Um, and this ist das möglich, we, da how is it possible? Um, um, in reading to us from the introduction uh, and some other chapters, you have kind of led us to begin to a point where we can begin to think about this we and the possibility of a different we. And one important aspect to me um, is really uh, the aspect 
of, of the we. When is a we a we? A we? Uh, uh, Where is the we? Is the we? How, is, how, is, how does the we um, das construct mich, um, a not we, uh, an other? Uh, and this leads me to Sasha's um, from, remark uh, white innocence, um, about white in innocence. Tat, it's eine, eine true that this is a figure that is... Um, also es gibt für mich keine abschließende, klare oder eine abschließende Antwort jetzt auf die no Frage, Ines. Aber ich möchte sie verbinden that you mit, mit me, einigen Ines dieser Figuren in um, der like Ines Essay. Uh, white Innocence ist ein epistemischer Gewalt. I would say ein, white Innocence is epistemic violence. Or epistemic violence is written into um, white Innocence. In dem Narrativ und white auch, und ich, würde es, ich nenne es immer Geisternarrative. Ich finde das uh, uh, spannend, um, of Ghosts, auch noch mal jetzt von dir zu hören, uh, Sabine, wie wichtig um, für dich auch, uh, um, from you, Sabine, die Figur der Geister war. Uh, um, White Innocence image of ist ghosts darin eingeschrieben so you. White in den Geisternarrativen der letzten into Jahrhunderte, wie wir narratives of ghosts that we auch Vorherrschaft have, um, um, zentriert haben. Um, ich möchte noch nicht centuries. sofort uh, dem, dem vorweggreifen, aber ich hoffe, dass wir uns auch um, ganz kreativ ahead, und liebevoll auch streiten können. Um, dafür möchte that ich auch gleich ein wenig and etwas anbieten um, und uh, werde mich dazu auch outen als like studierte Althistorikerin, die schon fast ein bisschen peinlich ist. Ancient history. Um, I'm muss ich dazu sagen. Aber gerade der Punkt zur Demokratie hat mich auch aus meiner Biografie, aus meiner DDR-Sozialisation immer etwas verstört. Ich stimme dir vollkommen zu, was letztendlich bereits in der ja, Grundlegung der, ich würde es schon nennen, modernen so Demokratie. The foundations of modern democracy uh, contain all sorts of exclusions and inequalities. But we could also think about the US Constitution, which is still presented to us in the global West as the foundation of democracy, which also includes that um, different degrees of humanity are attributed to different people. That is epistemic violence, and it's written into our bodies. And the embodiment of this violence, which can, or and of these narratives, which continue for centuries, is something that we have not yet put behind us. So we need an amendment in the, to the Constitution. It's important. It emphasizes the humanity of black people in the USA, recenters that humanity. But this amendment also involves elisions because it doesn't mention the indigenous population. And it doesn't speak in any way to the violence that has been embodied. So what does it do to white U.S. citizens. So all of this renders the question more complicated. The modern understanding of democracy becomes more complex when we consider these questions. So even Athenian democracy functioned in this way. Ultimately, citizens, male citizens, were um, essentially male, white, Athenian, cis males, and everyone else was turned into a marked subject that was excluded. Here too, as Akila Mbembe has made clear to us, democracy, it's clear, it, it's evident that democracy is not conceivable without coloniality. So the origins of Athenian democracy, or if we look at the origins of democracy in Athens, then we can see that the other side of democracy is barbarity or barbaros. This concept of the barbarian is one that goes back to Athenian democracy, and basically it refers to everyone who does, is not part of democracy, all of the excluded. Peggy, uh, may I just briefly uh, interrupt, uh, because Sabine did think about this. Does that mean that the term democracy is something you'd like to get rid of? Because uh, contrary to Sabine, you don't think that it can be filled differently or reformed uh, differently? Because you offer this loving argument. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
and you're accepting the challenge right away and re uh, returning to me with a difficult question. Well, I wouldn't immediately say that there are certain formats that we reject immediately, but we need to fill them with more content. And I'd like to quote Judith Butler again here when dealing with cosmopolitanism. And that also brings us to your discussions, Sabine, about citizenship and building the bridge to global citizenship. You're not speaking about cosmopolitanism, but you are opening a field of global citizenship and about the unchosen who are to unite globally. Now, this small essay by Judith Butler completely opened my eyes. I found it extremely fascinating because she focused on universalism and deconstructed it. She dismantled it. She says, it's possible only with the existence of the others. So minorities have to be there for universalism to be tangible, to be uh, applicable and be comprehensible. And I find this rather shocking because uh, it doesn't bring us away from a different we is possible, but it just makes meta matters much more complicated in a positive way because it means that we have to take this seriously. And I'd like to introduce a different figure here, namely that of radical positioning. Uh, opting for difference and then using that as a starting point and asking ourselves whether we can save democracy uh, in the way we understand it now. Thank you very much, Peggy. I'd like to uh, return to Sabine and uh, give her the possibility to respond before we come back to ra radical positioning that seems to be necessary in your mind to live this dream of a different we of democracy. Sabine, yes, and of, of course you can also reply to what Sasha said. Yes, yes, I'd like to speak about white innocence because that is also linked to the idea of universalism. This is part of the dream to stick with Butler. And I think we have to wake up from that dream because, and Peggy rightfully said so, it presupposes the others, it needs the others, the others who in my terminology have been converted to the unchosen. Uh, and the fact that Butler says we are all the unchosen, that's not true. It's just being placed on one part of a society so that the others can imagine themselves free. So uh, yes, and I've mentioned it before, it's not about some sort of catching up that we have to do, you know, in saying that we have to make sure that the marginalized of history become part of this promise of freedom and, and, and liberty in order to make this universalism complete. I think this simply ignores the fact that universalism is based on the paradox structure of equality and marginalization. Therefore, we need a completely new vision or version of universalism. And I'm slowly approaching the figure of white innocence here, because in my book, I was thinking about the figure of Franz Fanon. That's also what I ended with, who uh, f ends the wretched of the earth with the statement that we never learned to move forward in the society of all humans. That sounds like a banal statement, you know, in a 
community with all human beings. So people would say, oh, that sounds rather simple. We're all human beings after all, aren't we? And isn't that what it is about? And that makes us all equal. No, that's not true, even though my students often like to say that. No, Butler has shown us that only very few have been accepted to that illustrious circle and the others are excluded and therefore we're not speaking about liberty and equality but inequality. So we need a different idea of universalism and uh, I think here the figure of tender citizenship comes into play that really assumes itself as the radical positioning that doesn't only see itself but casts a view on the others, as Tukatruk says, the, the others that are not I. And that brings us to close to what's behind the epistemology of ignorance or white innocence. Gloria Becker, a colleague from the Netherlands, wrote a book about the uh, Dutch history, white innocences, and the paradoxes of waste. Can't remember the subtitle right now, but she speaks about the colonial history of the Netherlands. So what does it mean when Elsa Dollar says the privilege of the ruling ex exists in not having to know about the others? That means gaining time for yourself, having the time to only appreciate yourself, loving yourself. I don't even have to think about the others. I don't even have to consider the others. They're completely pushed out of my universe. Yeah, and that's also a basic figure of feminism. Patriarchal thinking does not think about sexist discrimination because it's sufficient to deal with yourself. And from a feminist perspective, you constantly have to introduce all these other narratives. So, I think as someone to be perceived as a white person um, who has always been privileged and will be privileged, I do replicate white innocence simply in being privileged. And time and again, I have to learn and unlearn this. That's also part of the Gunda Werner Institute to form these analogies to say, you know, if I criticize patriarchy uh, in that they don't tell these narratives, they don't uh, mention them, they don't materialize them, that at the same time makes me responsible to look at whiteness as a critical category and also to look at myself, to deprivilegize myself or to unlearn the privileges that I have, to think in these analogies. That was the last longer statement uh, I made, I promise. Yes, and I think what's also important is to look at the let's say, other side uh, of white ignorance and white innocence. And that is the fact that the white class is ruling, you know. And, and to me, as someone who produces knowledge, who produces interpretation and um, interpretation of the world, we also have to ask ourselves how we can understand ourselves as, as white people, and that's part of epistemic violence, namely that the ruling class provides the patterns within which we understand ourselves, race and gender above all, as perhaps the central categories with uh, which the subjugation of the many 
was successful and was accomplished because it imposes a world on them where they can only perceive or understand themselves in these categories or patterns of the ruling class. <clears throat> so that's one side which gives space and time to the ruling and the wealth, if you like, the comfortable situation of feeling good with themselves and at the same time it closes down the space of the others to be good to themselves because they find themselves again in the notions of, of the ruling and have to understand and comprehend themselves, conceive themselves in, in the notions of the ruling. Sasha, has this uh, answered your question? <laughs> yes, well, now I uh, know a lot more, I have to say. Well, it's, of course, not a question that can be answered. My fundamental problem, not with humanities, but perhaps the cultural area where I'm active, is that we're always looking somewhere else for the problem, and then we think, we found the answer. Okay, we're using the uh, gender uh, asterisk. That's the problem. Uh, uh, that's the solution. Or we uh, launch a program for refugees. That's the solution. Or we have a certain rate of POC women. That's our solution. But I think uh, both Peggy Peach and Sabine said that there is no quick fix for this, and that's why I'm constantly insisting on, on asking these same questions. I don't think we're leaving this room uh, with a solution in mind. When I speak about white innocence, I'm including myself because I think I'm moving in a system that doesn't give me any other choice. Under certain circumstances, I'm privileged, I'm stealing resources and space from others who need this. And I can't fight my way out of this. I can't demonstrate my way out of this. So it wasn't my intention to just find one single answer. But I think the question that we always have to ask ourselves is, what are we doing with us in, in very concrete terms? Yes, thank you very much for that question. Now, with a view to time, I'd like to come to the topic of the uh, dream of tenderness and the tender narrator. I have to ask you, when you write, do you think about t tenderness? No, I don't. The process of writing, in the best case, is something which is um, unconscious. I don't really think about this. I feel a lot of emotions. Virginia Woolf said, you don't have to be angry. And I often feel anger. Uh, I write out of anger. So no, there's uh, not a lot of tenderness when I uh, sit down uh, at my desk. But if I've understood Ms. Tokachuk uh, correctly, and you have to read that speech, Olga Tokachuk in her Nobel Prize uh, acceptance speech states that the tender narrator is someone telling a story from the fourth person. It's no longer about the I, the me in, 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 in the narrative. So if Olga Tokachok was here, and she was here in Berlin a few weeks ago, I'd love to discuss this with her. Perhaps that notion wasn't described uh, precisely enough in, in, in her speech, maybe because of a lack of time. I don't think it's no longer about addressing yourself as me. I think it's about the personification. There is a quote, uh, tenderness epitomizes or personalizes everything that you state. It provides time and space to uh, become a, a reality and to become a personality. Even a teapot becomes uh, tender because of uh, narration or narrative. Well, you, you may be right, but I think Olga Tokachuk often compares me against 
the we. I don't know whether this is meant in the plural or the global, but this is really something where I have my, my question mark because the tender uh, narrative with uh, Olga Tokachuk is many things, but it's not starting to think uh, with myself or myself in the main position, but us. And as an author, as a writer, I find this rather difficult. I don't think that writing works that way. Okay, um, let me turn to you, uh, Peggy. What do you think about this uh, idea of uh, tenderness, of uh, the tender narrator? I think uh, you also said that the unchosen is a figure of thinking and uh, a f figure of a certain search that takes place. So uh, a figure that looks for a different democratic we. What comes to your mind here, Peggy? I think the best way for me to approach this is to build the bridge to something that is personal. And then you ask yourself, who means this personal? And it, I think it's those who, who communicated epistemic violence out of history. And to be taken out of history means to forge a link, uh, to really cut the link to presence and the future. And then you ask yourself, how can we still tell these stories? How can we still have this experience? And I think this is something uh, this is which is no longer individualized, but it's a collective experience. And when I think about this figure, I think of two authors, Toni Morrison, who constantly describes this in her figure of remembering and also exercises that constantly. She's always been looking for that collective experience that has been supposedly cut off. And she asks herself, how can this be brought back? So I think that's a, a very important point of reference. Sasha. You also said you could call it empathy, and that's really, I think, something where we should get to. We should think about a collective empathy that we should try to get back. We're somehow cut off, cut off of that. Empathy is something that has been integrated into the power structures. It's not a free feeling that we can freely occupy. It's a figure that is closely linked to a power. And we see this when we look at collective uh, empathy and how we deal with atrocities in the global south. And then something happens in our neighboring village. And you can see this in the media 24-7. Both are important, but there is a clear imbalance. And the second writer that comes to my mind is Sharon Otu with her book Ada's Room, who also looks at tenderness of experience, the tenderness of knowledge, and of conveying that experience. That's something she deals with in her book. In with different objects, a doorknob, a broom, even a room or a wall that can pass on that experience and epitomizes that experience. So I think this can help us to also become more human. And I mean, that's what literature is there for after all as well. So where we've dehumanized ourselves from ourselves to really reach out and reconquer that, bring that back to us, give us a possibility and, and the option to do that. And I think this type of literature can do this. What types of we and I do we have? And, and there's one last uh, reference I'd like to make. 
Sabine, you are quoting Audre Lorde and one of my most fundamental references is the litany of survival. This depth of expression, we were never meant to survive. That can only be recovered with a tenderness or, in my words, collective empathy. So to respond directly to that, I believe it's very important when we speak about tenderness that we attempt to break with romantic associations. That's not what I want to talk about at all. And it, I don't think it's what Tokachuk wants to talk about. Peggy, you just talked about um, collective empathy. I would speak of a political virtue, namely the ability to be able to abstract from oneself and be able to perceive the world from a perspective that is not one's own. And that, of course, leads us to the question or leads us back to the question of power, because then the question becomes what perspectives exist. We spoke earlier about epistemic violence, and if epistemic violence at the core consists in the destruction of possibilities, of the ability to narrate oneself for oneself and others, to make oneself comprehensible to oneself and others, then of course it becomes a question of reclaiming or reinventing such possibilities, of creating such possibilities, and most importantly, and this is something we haven't spoken to um, at all so far, it's a question of accountability. That's a key concept in my book. What do we owe to one another? And what we owe one another is that the possibilities to create or to narrate ourselves are, we, we have um, reduced those possibilities in a violent way. We have destroyed them. This is something that we that we, we see every day. Species are uh, made extinct. Cultures, languages are destroyed. For some time now, we have been discussing more intensely the question of stolen artworks, artworks in our museums that were stolen in the context of colonialism. So this it, it, it's a, these artifacts are important because they would have allowed people to narrate their own history, and we have destroyed that possibility. And so this is what we need, first of all, to understand. And then for some of us, it becomes a question of taking responsibility. That's why the concept of accountability is important in this context and to come back once more to this image of a dream that we need to awaken from, it's important to recognize, to understand that we have destroyed world in a violent way, world that no longer exists and we have thereby diminished the possibilities for many people to lead a good life. Perhaps we have done so irre irredeemably, irremediably. I believe that's uh, important to perhaps not comment on that Im immediately, but just listen to what you've just said. I would like to invite the audience because uh, to, to um, get involved in the next half hour, because we have half an hour left. Questions for um, Sasha and Peggy, but also most importantly uh, for Sabina. Please uh, feel free to um, ask questions, whether you're here or following us online.
for those of you here in the room, there is a microphone that will be passed away. A colleague of mine has got an eye on who would like to ask a question. So before we... Ah, there is a question there. Um, so we're going to take a question that was posed online first. So we have a question from the chat from Helmut Scheel, and it's a question presumably addressed to Sabine. How do you imagine the development of a path towards un, an undifferentiated society, particularly with regard to the temporal perspective? Because, of course, the realization of such a society is not something that can happen overnight. And, of course, everyone needs to be involved in that process um, and in different ways, depending on their personality and background. Well, of course, it would be very easy if I could say these are the steps we need to take and in so and so many years we will have achieved our goal. I would be very happy if I were able to write that kind of book. But I think what's important first and foremost, that the goal is not an undifferentiated society. I think that's very important. I think the goal rather is a society in which difference is finally allowed to exist and can exist. In the early 90s, it was already said that the problem of the 21st century was going to be how to live with difference. And I think that was very prescient. These are precise, this is precisely the challenge that we are faced with today. The challenge of finally accepting difference. And this is not something um, that's quite correct that we can do overnight. I believe Peggy spoke to this and Ines also briefly mentioned this. The book begins with a reflection that picks up on a sentence, a statement by Audre Lorde in a conversation with Adrian Rich. And Audre Lorde describes her experience as a teacher in Manhattan in the early 70s. And she says her way of teaching was never to swamp the students with tons of literature and reading materials. She did something that she called confrontation teaching. And she says in this context that it was there that she understood that a learning process is something like a riot. And a riot is also a form of learning or a kind of learning process. And this makes it clear that a learning process is something that takes a long time, or at least it takes time. It's differently from the image that we have of a riot. We build barricades, we storm the barricades, and then the next day the world is a different one. It has never worked that way. And I think we need perhaps to do away with the masculinist and um, heroic fantasies that are contained in these images. I believe that it's a slow and very difficult process of learning and of unlearning, unlearning the culture of domination. If Peggy is right, and it's not just that for 500 years, uh, since the uh, so since the Europeans reached the so-called New World and asked themselves, are these humans at all that we are um, encountering here in the first ones that they took back to the old world and presented to their rulers, they said, these are the specimens that we found over there and we believe they are not they are not humans. So if Peggy is right, 
This history goes back even further than just 500 years. And so that means it's quite a long path of unlearning the culture of domination that we are confronted with. All of the pores of our society are saturated with this way of thinking in terms of relations of supra and subordination when we encounter others in the world. So it's a difficult path, but it's one on which we have some, from which we have something to gain. As Fanon says, the prospect is that of being able to move forward in the company of all people. I have two questions. I like the book a great deal, and I am also enjoying this uh, discussion. My first question is perhaps more academic. There are a few, I wouldn't say competing, but perhaps related projects that are looking for something similar, a perspective based on community that moves beyond Western or neoliberal individualism. So I'm thinking of the, uh, the, the Ubuntu approach from South Africa or texts from France. Now, these are texts that are not mentioned in your book, but I would be very interested in knowing how you relate what you have done to these other projects. That's my first question. And the second question is more political. It's a bit like the question that was just formulated in the chat, but I would like to ask the second question anyway, even though you have already, in a way, spoken to it. You've said that analytically viewed, the relationship between brute and tender citizenship is one of opposition. But I would be interested in knowing whether you have any ideas about how these two forms relate to one another politically, if or could relate to one another politically. Um, if your um, perspective is implemented, do you think that tender citizenship will develop in societal niches and um, and will exist in parallel to brute citizenship. Um, of course, these brute citizens, some of them are murderers. The names of their victims are, on, are, are projected on the screen behind you. Do you think we can perhaps uh, win brute citizens over by speaking to them, by talking to them? Thank you. Two very important questions. I have indeed um, looked or, or engaged uh, r neither with Ubuntu nor with the um, manifesto that you mentioned from France. These are ideas that uh, I am aware of that are present within the horizon of my work, but I felt that I n didn't so much need to um, distance myself from those approaches, but in order to develop my own ideas, I felt that I can't immediately engage with uh, a vision that is perhaps in many ways, yes, related to mine, because I also believe that it makes a significant or that there is a significant difference. I tried, I tried to develop a certain idea of community. The book is called A Community of the Unchosen. So I'm not trying to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to de develop the idea of one particular community or one particular idea of community. I want to think about um, the, um, the, the nature of community when it's based on reciprocity and reckoning and responsibility. And it's also based on um, th uh, three forms of care, care for ourselves, care for others, and care for the world. Now, that's something that we haven't spoken about tonight. But I was concerned less with um, developing a certain idea of community than with developing a notion of what it means to live in a community. A notion. So I, I, I kept my distance from these other approaches just in order to be able to develop my own ideas. But of course, it's something that I will, uh, that I still will need to do to engage uh, with these other projects and, and, and see how they can be um, made to, um, to gel and to um, 
this, what about this other question about um, the two forms of citizenship? Well, this may be naive, but I do hope that tender citizenship will displace brute citizenship because brute citizenship is the emblem of an age in which neoliberalism and the authoritarian revolt have, as it were, fused and become hegemonic in the world. And so, of course, my hope is that tender citizenship dis overcomes this hegemony. But, of course, that may be a naive, an overly naive hope. But the other question, the question that lurks behind that first one, what do we do with those who are not willing to share the world with us? If that is the key issue, my book ends with the sentence, we will learn to share the world with everyone or we will not exist, period. But what do we do with those who are precisely not willing to bring, uh, to, to strive for this goal. Hannah Arendt has been an important reference point for me and continues to be so. And I, I take uh, from her this idea of the unchosen to a considerable degree, or I owe it to her largely. And she writes in her book on Eichmann in Jerusalem in the final epilogue, she, she writes a kind of um, fictional uh, monologue directed at directed to Eichmann and she talks about why she felt it was important that Eichmann was condemned to death and executed and she says because the Nazis claimed for themselves a right that does not exist namely the right to decide with whom they want to live on this earth and because the Nazis did that no one of those who have survived can be forced to um, coexist with these kinds of people. Now, I am not an advocate of the death penalty. That's not what's. That's not the option that that we we should. Ha we don't have the option of simply killing our enemies, and this means that we have only one option, namely that of trying to persuade them that they should change uh, their ways change their politics and their attitude, their, their, change their unwillingness to share the world. I know this sounds perhaps naive. No, I don't think so at all. If you say the only w way not to fall back into a state of war is um, that of persuading people uh, uh, is, is the the option of a tenderness that is not a tenderness in a romantic sense. So I believe this is a hypothesis that is very much worth discussing. Very briefly, since I'm uh, um, facilitating this panel, I would like to um, ask you to please um, be brief because we would like to hear more questions. Yes, I don't have a, a, a question, but I would have had a question directly relating directly to what was just said, but perhaps we should give people in the audience a chance to ask their questions. Thank you very much. I'm not convinced by this notion of tenderness. I'm generally a great fan of tenderness, but I'm not convinced of the way um, the concept operates in this context, in this framework, a framework that's characterized on the one hand by what Sasha has just repeated or just um, the, the notion that the crime consists in innocence, as James Baldwin said. And we have heard uh, from Peggy a few other literary references. And when I think of Audre Lorde, and when I think of learning processes that Audre Lorde caused, Audre Lorde, of course, is an important reference point for you, then I would say that to me, it's a question of something that I haven't really um, found in what has been said so far. Uh, the, the question of how, uh, of, of how do we get where we want to 
B, um, there's this question of affect. Um, Sasha mentioned one affect, the affect of rage. When I read the names projected on the screen, I also feel other affects, other emotions. And so these notions of um, epistemic violence and learning processes um, are not so uh, all, these things are not so easy. We all have had the experience of getting drawn into intense confrontations when it comes to racism. And so this notion of uh, tenderness uh, to me is, is not, it's just not good enough. I would ask you about affect and also about the um, possibility of a different way of speaking and narrating. So this uh, notion of the tender narrator is perhaps only one aspect of that. Perhaps we just collect a few questions before we return to the panel. Yes, I think Tanya wanted to ask a question and then we can also have another look at the chat online. Yes. Thank you very much. I have a question on the power structures uh, with regard to uh, tender and brute citizenship. Can you really distinguish these two notions? Isn't it rather the fact that both notions mix up in one and the same person? Gerhard Schröder, for instance, in the past was very empathic when it came to victims of the flood but not very empathic when it came to recipients of social benefits, hearts fear, hearts fall. So it's one and the same person and you find both sides in them. So it's rather difficult to, to create this image of, of an enemy or to attribute this to certain individuals. So aren't these two types of citizenship intrinsically linked? And uh, how can we uh, do justice to this fact that a simple attribution simply doesn't work here? And since we're at it, the fact that it's one and the same person, you're speaking about domination and attitudes of domination. Are you also dealing with domination within declassified groups in your book? where we're also seeing that within the marginalized, within that group, we can also find epistemic violence, meaning that this phenomenon is a universal phenomenon. And at the same time, um, it's difficult to speak about it from my position. So, you know, this internal power structure or epistemic violence that you still find within uh, one group. Okay, maybe you can answer to these questions and try to be brief. I know it's difficult, <laughs> just kindly asking you because we're running out of time. Yes, I'm trying. Well, of course, and I, I said that at the beginning, when we assume that this is a, a learning process that takes a long time and a lot of effort, a learning process that is difficult because different effects are involved because it's about rejecting something. Anna Freud once said, we don't really want to learn because learn is expecting, asking something from us, namely that we change. And basically, we don't want to change. So that's something, of course, we have to deal with also with regard to effect. The domination culture is also based on a culture of affects. It produces affects and stages them, instrumentalizes them. So domination culture works because our emotions our affects are being regulated, are being controlled in that it determines what we like and what we reject, what we find appalling. This is not something natural. 
it is produced politically and it's instrumentalized. So to that extent, yes, I should like to say with tenderness alone, uh, we won't be able to accomplish much, but we should start off by understanding tenderness as an epistemic attitude, an epistemic position, perhaps also a political position. Hannah Arendt spoke about an, an expanded way of thinking. In political activism, we often say, put yourselves in their shoes. And Peggy at the beginning spoke about an offer of solidarity. So that means being aware of your own position, reflecting on your own position, even communicating clearly and making it visible that it's about different types and ways of positioning, and that this has been organized by the privileged classes in, in such a way that it cannot be made available unconditionally because it's not being recognized as a partial position, but as a universal position. I know I'm giving a, a long answer again, <laughs> but yes, these other affects have to be brought into play and have to be recognized and worked on as, as moments of power. And perhaps briefly on what you asked, Tanya, no, I haven't dealt with this, with the experiences of domination culture, the way this is being staged in marginalized groups, or the way this takes place in marginalized groups. That's not my main focus in the book. However, theoretically, my, my line of argument is that uh, using the words of Birgit Rommelspacher, uh, that our culture is a clear domination culture through and through, then of course that question comes into play. But I was rather asking myself, what is the task of individuals like me, who are in my position or in a similar position like me, namely white academic scholars with a lot of symbolic capital, with a lot of interpretive authority, if you like, uh, that I have as an intellectual? So that was one of the, the questions that uh, I was also trying to answer um, behind the scenes, perhaps. And what does that mean? I mean, which tasks w would follow? I think uh, Peggy wanted to say something. Peggy, may I just briefly, briefly turn to the online audience and, and then we'll give you the floor again. Yes. We have three more questions to Sabine, and I'd uh, like to uh, ask them together. Teresa Koluma Beck says uh, you're speaking a lot about the first person in the plural, we. So who is the we? How can it be determined? And the other question looks again at the term of the unchosen. Annika Engel writes, the figure of the unchosen in your book is constructed in a targeted ambiguity. So it's ambiguous. On, on the one hand, it's a universal figure towards the end of your book, but in the middle, you're also referring or alluding to those excluded. And the question is, why have you um, chosen to use two contradicting um, significances? 
Yeah, on the we, I've intentionally opted for we because I didn't want to use the German Mann, which resembles man. And we is something that is not predetermined by us, but is ahead of us, rather. So it's in the future. And at the same time, it's the normative driver or engine, because we constantly have to ask ourselves, who can be part of that we? How have we organized our world um, when we look at the fact that only a few can be part of that we, but our aim is to, to create a world where we all can be we. So I think that's what that's how I'd like to understand my we, uh, something that speaks to us from the future. And the second question on, on the unchosen, yes, uh, you are right. It's about this tension between the two dimension of being unchosen. Firstly, as a th theoretical figure of, of searching, as a theoretical outline, Suchfigur, um, that looks at, at these ideas of uh, privileges and marginalization and, and wants to work on, on these uh, notions. And I think what's a scandal, really, like Butler and Arendt are putting it, is that all of us are unchosen if no one has been selected. And that could be the beginning of thinking about our ways of cohabitation, of coexisting, namely that we're all unchosen and that we have to live with those that we have not chosen and that we would not choose. Because then we would have these two dimensions, if I've understood that question correctly, the, the universal dimension namely taking the perspective of the unchosen and being able to look at this situation or have a situation where this condition of being unchosen is distributed in a differential way because only part of us can be free because the, of, of them can be free because they consider themselves as chosen and automatically turn the other ones into the unchosen. So Hart Negri speaks about the multitude, this idea that the suppressed of, of all countries are uniting. No, that, that's not what I meant. It's rather about this idea what does it really mean to think that we all have the same right of existence? Peggy, you also wanted to take the floor. Perhaps you can also try to be brief. It's almost nine o'clock and we've got uh, a great attention span here in the audience, but I think we have to slowly but surely come to an end. Well, I, it wasn't really a question. It's rather an observation. I found this uh, exchange right now very, very intriguing and also extremely important, namely the question of, of whether within the deprivileged we, we also had different layers of, of the we. That's not how I read your book and you also confirmed that, Sabine, but I found this interaction very interesting because I think that's a risk that we're running when we turn to that we and make it a, a, a social aspect way too fast. I think that we should aim for a we of diversity and not leaping forward too much in order for the we from the future to to be at eye level with us to to get 
at the same level with us, it takes much more work. So we have to be cautious because there are those who use we as a social layer to still impose and, and, and continue their principle of power. Is there a last question in the room? Yes, there is one more. Well, I think we're living in the present and now, and I'm quite far away from that we uh, in a community. What happens with the people in Belarus, for instance, those who are stuck at the Polish border? Don't you think it's time to act? But I'm not hearing any we, any unity of, of no political party whatsoever, perhaps only in a, in a transient position. I think we should be acting now. I don't want to get lost in all of these ideas. And what I'm seeing is that we're just isolating ourselves even more. We don't even want to hear about that anymore. That's where I would start. Yes, of course, uh, you're absolutely right. That's the question we have to ask. And this is where we have to take action. Who are the ones who are denied the right to come and to stay? That is the starting point of my book. And this is uh, really something where we can all be active every day. And we should indeed do so, yes. Okay, I would like to thank you all. First of all, thank you so much, dear Sabine, for providing us with these very interesting insights into your book, into your way of thinking. It was uh, merely a flashlight uh, because we couldn't, uh, of course, comprehensively deal with all the details in the book. But it's certainly great food for thought. Thank you very much, Sasha, for your questions, for your comments as a companion in thought, as uh, a writer and an author. Uh, not only for, for Sabine, but uh, for progressive thinking in general. Thank you so much, Peggy, for having uh, locked on uh, virtually, at least. It's great to still be able to have you here. Thank you to the audience for having found the way to the Gunda Werner Institute and the Heinrich Böll Foundation for having listened so attentively. I think um, that's also something that was a great support for us here um, at the panel. And thank you to the online audience. Uh, sometimes it's said that we can only address you indirectly, but you're as important and as supportive to us. Just a uh, uh, brief remark. Uh, Sabine is also signing her books. <laughs> uh, that's a pity for people joining us over Zoom. But if you've got a book or a copy with you, or if you'd like to buy a book uh, right now, Sabine will sign it for you. Uh, please keep your masks on. And you're most welcome to uh, approach Sabine. And I think that would be a wonderful end. Thank you all so much. Uh, be safe, stay healthy, good night.